So this is all the stock. So I've whipped the stock out of the cold rooms because I want to obviously put in there the cooling um, matrixes. So that's what we're holding in stock at the minute. It's quite a bit actually. Probably got one, two, three, maybe four pallets of beer. Uh, 20, maybe 60 casks and keg mixed. Which isn't a lot, let's be honest, but for a micro pub, it's quite a bit. And of course, we've got these three tanks full of beer as well. So I'm not sure whether I really need to brew on Monday, to be quite honest, but we'll go ahead and do it anyway. We could probably get a little bit experimental right off the bat and not have to do the vacant. Let me turn the radio off and then we'll go into the uh, cold room and have a look what we're going to start doing today. So uh, let's take you into this one, it's a little bit bigger. There's a little bit more light to be able to see what's going on a little bit better. So at the back of the cold room, this is where we're going to house the cooling matrix. Let's put that that way so it don't fall off. The cooling matrix and the fan. So I've ordered exactly the same car radiator. It's basically a universal car radi radiator for a, a 1 litre to 1.2 litre engine. It's got two connections on this side. I've ordered some silicon reducers which should take me down to about the OD of a 15 millimeter push fit fitting. So that'll take us from this big 34 mil bore down so we can start using the 15 mil push fit uh, pipe work. So once I've got this into position and suspended, which is probably gonna live a little something like that so it's on a bit of a camber and then either on the front or the back we'll mount the fan this is an 80 watt 80 watt 12 volt fan and then that should be enough that should be sufficient to pull the cold air into this particular uh, chamber this one of course only needs the one fan so we might mount in between the timber like this somehow but on the end chambers where they're only a pallet wide we'll definitely just be using uh, the back section angled in because we want to get casks in you see a pallet of casks so we want to make sure that we're not fouling fouling the casks we also want to make sure that we're not vacuumed against the board as such so as soon as I determine where and how I'm going to hang these all with the outlets on the same side of course then I can just start to come in with the pipe work today and I can get the pipe work in place knowing full well all I'm going to have to do is connect her up when the rest of the equipment arrives um, each one of these is also going to require a motorized valve and a thermo probe, a temperature probe for inside the cold room. But what I think I'm going to do with that is we'll house the STC and everything else, maybe uh, just above the cold room door, but the motorized valves and everything are all going to be housed at the end, and each possibly each pipe work section will have its own motorized valve down there. We'll see, it might be easier to house it actually on the unit, so we'll we'll have a look at that when we come to it. So uh, yeah, I'm just gonna get some fittings and some pipe work and we'll see where she's gonna live and we'll come back and I'll show you what I've done. Okie doke folks. So I've done a little bit of playing around and uh, we've got the fan mounted onto two blocks of wood and the fans come with these little spring kits. So there's a little bit of you know, uh, play to take the vibration out on the mounts. I'm not sure how we're going to mount this to the fan yet, but at least putting these two little timber pads on gives me something that I can come off. What I'm hoping to do, I think, is create some type of hook over the top system like that, and then have maybe something that comes up from underneath to sort of hold it in place but we want to be just off just off the uh, the cooling 
fins like there and then if we get like a, a dead spot I'll be able to slide it across and help you know let's say it starts to ice up a little bit here I'll just be able to slide it across and concentrate the fan there but we'll start with it in the center and then what I've done I've taken a 12 volt feed from the fan which is just the supply um, rotating the cables backwards one way or the other reversing them makes the fan either blow or suck so I've got it to suck air through the fins and eject it out the back of the fan that way I'm thinking that the cold will help keep the motor cool as well uh, it should be fine anyway and then we've got this running through a um, 16 amp 12 volt power supply these are dead cheap on eBay this isn't what I'm going to use for all of them I've ordered a bigger I think a 40 amp unit to uh, to control all the rest of them but this is good for testing because it's only pulling it's pulling less than an amp anyway and then we're running this through the cliff quick test this is made famous by of course bigclive.com friggin rats it is so when I close the lid it energizes the power supply which then energizes the fan so you'll see this now there we go and it's not too loud actually and the reason it's not too loud is because I've throttled down the power on the power supply unit so it's only running at around 11 and a half volts not at the uh, 12 volts that uh, it's rated at so with these power supply units there's generally a little potentiometer just down in there I think if I zoom right in you just might be able to spot it just there look so that little fella there you can turn it one way or another and I did that whilst holding the multimeter set to DC volts on the contacts, on the DC contacts, not the AC contacts, not the live in and uh, it varies from 13.8 volts down to 11 point I think it was 11 point something or other let's have a look I may as well show you while I'm here, haven't I? so let's bring the camera around and have a look at the multimeter let's get down on it so you can see exactly what we're doing here how's that so um, if I pop let's think I don't want the fan to run so let's just zip off one of the legs like that that's fine then we can close this and we can take a reading and we're coming out at 11.3 volts Seems to be dancing around a little bit there because there's no load on it. Let's pop a load on it then and then we'll take a reading so you'll not be able to hear me for a minute. I can hear it clicking on and off. It's because it's a cheapo system. There we go. So let's put the load on it. So, with the load on, you can see that we're steady at 11.2 volts, 11.3 volts. And if I take the little screwdriver thing and uh, try and do all this together in one shot and then we start to oh my goodness sake lad there we go and then if we turn this slightly you can hear the fan speed increase so we're up to 13.1 volts now and you can dial it in Now the benefit, the benefit of doing this is that we'll be under running the fan which means it's pulling less power, it's liable to last longer, it's not going to overheat as much and also if I run you down here, so if I pop you on this power meter, let's get a good angle where we can see it, there we go so one of the reasons why we want to go ahead and vary the uh, power supply is because this is set to amps at the top here it's running a lot 
lower in terms of the amperage. So if we turn it back on again, you'll see that uh, it's pulling 6.9 amps, nearly 7 amps, uh, sorry, 0 0.69 amps, so 600 milliamps. Whereas if we turn the regulator, there we go, it's running at 480 milliamps. That's half an amp for that fan. So it's dropped almost quarter of its power consumption. So everything, effectively, is gonna last a little bit longer. Uh, it's dropped, it's dropped around 150 milliamps. So that means that we're underrunning we're underrunning the fan, we're underrunning the power supply, everything should last a little bit longer. Well that's my theory anyway, so if anybody knows anything to the contrary let me know, but uh, from what I've seen on other electrical uh, YouTubers channels, particularly Big Clive, he tends to do this with things like LEDs, so he'll underrun LEDs, they last longer, they don't get as hot. And of course it's generally heat that damages electrical components, so if we're going to underrun everything then surely we should be putting a little bit more uh, life into them, they should last a bit longer. Pretty sure underrunning the fan's fine, underrunning the power supply, I don't see how it would make a difference, uh, I don't see why it would damage it, I'm sure it wouldn't. So that's what we're going to do with the uh, full setup when we've got it all installed. We're going to set it up, we're going to dial the power supply back to about 11 volts and we're going to run everything at steady at 11 volts. Uh, the only problem I can see is that the motor doesn't have enough torque, so if that's an issue we'll come back to that. So all I need to do now is try and figure out how we are actually going to mount this fan assembly to this cooling fin so as not to foul it and uh, to make it easy to move back and forth. I think I've got an idea. Well, I've come up with a fantastic idea for a mount. Let's just move you back a touch. So, I hope you can see this. Uh, but it seems to work an absolute treat. So, I'll just take this little screw out here. So. You take that screw out, rotate this section, and then we've got full access to the radiator. Should we need to remove it, replace it, defrost it, whatever we need to do. Turn it round, anything you like. And then all we've got is a square frame here with a couple of screws popped right into this section here. So these screws here, they are slightly proud of the timber work so you wind these in and out to grab onto the the frame of the chilling unit and uh, also the fan itself as you can see moves it's definitely not going to rattle too much because it's still on those springs that we've got mounted on there so none of it's touching the actual timber itself then on the back side up here We've got a piece of timber that goes from one upright to the next and I've cut a little arch in the top of it so it doesn't foul the top of this fan and that's holding the whole segment. In fact, I could be as brash as to uh, zoom out and remove the whole thing so you can see what it looks like from front to back. There we have it, so you can see I've cut it out on the back side so it doesn't foul the fan. All of the uh, spring loaded sections are bolted in there and also at the bottom edge here. So that very simply just goes into a position where I think it's not going to foul any casks or anything else when we have, uh, when we have stock in the cold room and then just a case of fixing her back to the wall and then what we're going to do is let's make out we're assembling it for the first time this is going to go in there like that so we now have 
the fan and the cooling matrix, if you like, all in position. Just line that screw all up. So this uh, this front bar is just to nip it. We don't want it too tight because it can actually slide backwards and forwards if we need it to. We don't need it to. And then if I just go ahead and poke these two wires into their respective pokey holes we can slam this down and away she goes drawing air in through here blowing it out the other side creating a circular vortex if you like and uh, well it's not too loud but it's definitely got enough air movement to keep this fridge nice and cool I'm really chuffed with how that's panned out, to be fair. So now all I have to do is repeat the process in each of these uh, cold rooms, and then we're gonna fetch the pipework off this side. So all I need to do effectively to install the pipework is bring all the pipes in, uh, and we'll just run straight through the back with the main feed for the flow and return. And then uh, at each junction, we'll put a T in, and we'll T off the main feed straight into the uh, the matrix of course the end one doesn't need a T we'll just put that straight into the matrix itself maybe a 90 degree bend on there or something but I am very very impressed with how that sits so the test will be can we get a full cask of pallets in here what a full pallet of casks in here without fouling the whole unit but we've taken up I think less than three inches not going to be a problem. Right, so that's all of the fans put together with their cooling matrixes. Always oh, adjusting the camera, man. So, uh, they've actually only sent two radiators when I ordered three, so I've pinged them off an email on eBay. Hopefully, that will be here before uh, we start doing this next week or so. There's always a problem, isn't there? But what I want to do is, uh, while we're going to have to wait for this stuff to arrive anyway, focus a little bit on the controlling side of each cooling chamber so each cold room chamber wants to have its own on and off switch essentially and its own temperature scale so we can set one of them to cell attempts at 12 degrees or we can set one to four degrees if we want to store hops in there for instance so uh, i'm going to look at my fermentation tank controller and we're going to go from there and modify it so if you look down here I've already got one open ready for you to observe and this basically works again off an STC 1000 mounted in the front of this uh, enclosure for your information it's a 10 by 8 enclosure and uh, the depth of this as well is about four inches so inside we've got the STC 1000 which controls three re relays essentially so when the STC senses uh, the incorrect temperature let's say it wants to call for heat then it'll switch its heating uh, relay on in here that will then energize a coil for this relay here the heating relay on the far right hand side. When that heating relay is closed then you'd have an external heating line coming into the unit going via the contacts, the normally open contacts on the relay. Once it's engaged they'll be closed thus providing power 
to your heating element. If it's a heavy industrial heating element, you could use that to switch a large contactor so you could run the contactor through this system as well. Uh, if it calls for cool on the other hand, it'll switch its internal, the STC will switch its internal cooling relay, thus closing the contacts on both of these. So uh, what happens is when there's no heat or cold required or heat is required this valve relay uh, is set to its normally open position but on its normally closed contacts because it's a double pole double throw relay on its normally closed contacts we've got power from this power supply unit here um, engaged to provide DC positive DC negative like such to a motorized valve when we energize this coil it switches those poles so what was positive now becomes negative vice versa and that changes the polarity in the motorized valve opening the valve and also at the same time it energizes the contacts in the pump relay the P relay and this closes the contacts which turn on the recirculation pump at the glycol bath. So we don't have the glycol bath constantly recirculating glycol throughout the system if indeed the system is at temperature. It's just a waste of heat. So that's how this works ultimately. What we need to do is incorporate um, fan control as long uh, alongside um, the valve control and the pump control so we could essentially eliminate the heating relay um, disconnect it from the heating side of the STC 1000 and uh, join it up to the other two cooling relays and when the cooling relay comes on it will also activate all three of these contacts and then we could run our 12 volt supply from the big heavy 40 amp uh, power supply unit. We could run that through here as well. So that would switch the fan on or off via this. So this particular relay, we'd just relabel it with a C uh, or an F for the fan. Simple as that. So I'm gonna take this apart uh, on a piece of paper, not literally and see if we can reroute some of this cabling to ensure that each function that we need is being met. So for instance, the motorized valve stuff, that's good, that can stay. The pump, well I have to decide, am I gonna be activating the glycol pump on top of the glycol bath? Uh, would it be safe not to have that recirculating? I think so, it's not gonna freeze. So we could activate that by this and uh, and yeah, then the fan through that. I think that's all we need. And then of course, uh, you can daisy chain these systems. I've used these particular Robus Swift uh, couplers which link together like such. So you can have 10 or 15 of these systems in a line and uh, what that will do is allow the pump to be switched on by any of the any of the control boxes in the system um, without having to have several cables running into the pump they're all just daisy chained in and out of these particular couplers and also these couplers will carry power from one unit to the next you only need a plug on the first unit and then you just plug your second unit in plug your third unit in and I think you could run um, provided you're switching all your electrics with relays I think you could run 10 or 15 on these quite happily without pulling anything more than like four or five amps so that's what I've got set up for controlling the fermenters this was one I built spare when I built the other three for the fermentation control we've got at the moment on the tanks over yonder and uh, yeah I'm quite chuffed with it actually when I opened it back up I thought ah oh, an old friend. It was all familiar to me again. 
so I forgot which side I'd hinged it though so if I do that and you can hinge the box works a treat I better go and order some more of these well I'm gonna have to leave that there folks it is Friday after all and I normally shoot back home with Gemma when she does the school run these days uh, I'll tell you what though cooling unit number one cooling unit number two and yes cooling unit number three so you can already see that this is gonna work I just know it keys right I'll put you in the camera bag and off we shall trot we're home we've been shopping we've had an argument our relationships rapidly deteriorating I don't know what we're gonna do Move out. Move out. We're both moving out. The kids can bring themselves up. I'm supping on a Harbour Puffing Tears IPA. <laughs> Puffing Tears. Yeah. It's definitely an original name. So, uh, I've got some more beers in here as well. Don't be surprised if Gemma locks me out. So, a treat especial, folks. This is the beer fridge, which also doubles up as the meat fridge during the week so uh, we've got chicken down there we've got more jerky marinating away and then because I've just made my pale for work I have bought Sierra Nevada pale ale to see how close I got because my original pale ale for Idle Valley was a clone of this um, very close then we've got some beers that oh, Helltown West Coast We've got some beers that were sent to me, or delivered, should I say, by Rob. Um, here's Wildwood Organic Dry Cider. I can't actually remember picking that up in the supermarket. Uh, Centennial IPA from Founders, another cracking beer. These are all supermarket specials, so don't get carried away. I'm not saying these are fantastic beers or anything. We just went to Morrison's Torpedo Extra. This I've never seen before. Anguletti. It's an Italian craft cider, so I thought I'd give that one a whirl. And then in here, we've got uh, Thirsty Farmer and Nottinghamshire cider. Of course, we're in Retford, Nottinghamshire, so that's a good thing. And if this will come out, Harry Sparrow. I only picked it up because of the name, Harry. So we've got a nice little selection of commercials beers and ciders for tonight because yes I am a cider meister believe it or not and then also many of you may recognize some of these beers in here I've not drank this one yet American Queen or something I don't know who's given me that Honey Porter still in here I think that one is uh, here's another one from Rob oh check it out so yes there's a bit of beer to be drank tonight and then with the uh, oh shit the tits put the bottles away then Terry before you close the bloody door and then with the dehydrator people have been asking what actually is it so it's an electric IQ model you can see there just about uh, it was about 50 to 60 quid from Appliance Direct and at the moment in here we're having a play about with some fruit. Some apples and oranges, some melon. That's just about dried. And in the bottom, we had a pineapple that was almost past its best. That's taken a long time to dry out. And the brown bit is where it had gone like, you know, like a banana goes brown. So it's really sweet there, but I don't eat much pineapple, so. We'll see how that comes out, but that's about done. And then uh, tomorrow after that meet down there has had an hour marinating, uh, in an evening should I say, we'll be putting that in. And then next to the mouldy beer jug, check that out folks. That's the slops out of the taps by the way. I'll leave it there because we're basically in a porch, you see, outside. We get the occasional slug or snail find their way in. Where do they go? Into the slops bucket. It keeps them off my taps, always thinking. So here are some of 
the past few days jerky uh, concoctions folks and check them out don't they look fantastic so uh, this bunch here was dried for I think it was 10 hours at 70 the garlic stuff in the kitchen was dried for 6 hours at 70 the new stuff which we're gonna do the stuff that's in the fridge I'm gonna dry uh, for 5 to 10 hours at 50 somebody left a comment on one of the videos the other day and said 70 is too high the reason I did it at 70 was because obviously you kill pathogens at 70 I didn't think you did it at 50 but I'm the only one gonna be eating it so we'll give it a freaking whirl and if it works out better it'll work out better if not it doesn't and then uh, talking of jerky well my mate Craig's got a dehydrator and uh, he's bought some beef and he's popped it into his dehydrator and he said that we should start a YouTube jerk off challenge because uh, well neither of us know a bigger jerk off than each other quite frankly so show us your jerky post a reply down in the bottom with a link to a YouTube video or Facebook post or pictures or whatever you've got of your jerky and tell us how you make it what your recipes are I'm quite into it at the minute I've almost eaten my uh, my body weight in dried beef so leave it in the comment section below folks and uh, I'll have a look with interest and we'll decide over the next few months who's the biggest jerky jerk in the world that's right how interested she is in everything that I do it's brilliant right we're gonna wrap it up for Friday um, might get a vlog out tomorrow might not always a little bit iffy on the weekends but thanks for joining me today anyway and uh, well I'll see you on the next one cheers